coolest people in the Zoom universe. This is your girl, Dr. Helena G. Lewis, reporting on behalf of the New Week and Ballers Cafe. I hope we don't got anybody in here that's trying to clown us because last time somebody danced naked across the screen, I didn't appreciate that. I'm just letting you know how I feel. But this is poetry and protest actually inspired by the legendary Miguel Aguirre. May he rest in peace. He used to teach a class at Rutgers University called Poetry and Protest. So I was talking to Jason and I was like, yo, we should do a show, Black History Month, where I think Black History Month should be all month. And um, let's call it Poetry and Protest. So I called up some of my community activists and was like, yo, I'm gonna need y'all to get down on this show. So you'll just hold on for a few seconds. We're still letting everybody in. We have some tech problems. I for, I'm so sad. I'm so mad that happened. But you know, it is what it is. If you're just now tuning in, this is a girl, Dr. Helene D. Lewis, reporting on behalf of the New York Week and Polis Cafe. Welcome to Poetry and Protest. We're not on yet. My screen is Hey, Amira. Yes, Do you sir. have Rob's phone number? He is lost somewhere. Rob, <laughs> he's texting me now saying, he, are we on? I'm going to tell him yes. Yeah, try to get him situated, situated, situated. Let me All turn right, good people. Office. Jason, let me know when we live. We're just waiting to go live before we get to talking, talking, talking. About one minute. Should be good. One minute. Setting up. And about one minute. So listen, when I say all this stuff that I just said before, just pretend like y'all didn't hear me and this is all brand new stuff. Of course, we got everybody muted. So if you want to wave a shout out, if you do like this, I know that you are applauded and that's fine, good and dandy. Let me see who I see out there. I see Jade, I see Madison, I see Fluffy Slinger. Hmm. I see Angoma, Helen Davis, how you doing? I found, I don't know who you are, but I'm just going to assume you're fine. James, Catherine, Nicole, Michael, Nikki, Patrice, welcome to Poetry and Protest. If you're just now tuning in, this is your girl, Dr. Helene D. Lewis, reporting on behalf of New Rican Poets Cafe in the Zoom universe for Poetry and Protest. I'm just waiting for us to go live so that we can go ahead and start the show. Also, um, if anybody is reaching out to Rob, um, I, I cannot assist him because I have to turn my head. So I'm just going to hope he gets in. All right now. All right, all right, all right. Jason, let me know when we go live. Let me turn this off before um, we get kicked off of our, um, Facebook for playing unauthorized music. <laughs> that was Rare. Um, Take Back the Power. That's one of my new favorite songs now. Hey, Matt, I see you waving. All right. Okay. Oh, we got a bunch of people up in here. Let me see all the people. Okay. It's more. Oh, wow. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. We also are going to have an open mic, a brief open mic. Let me rephrase myself at the end of the show. If you are interested in being on the open mic, just send me a little private message on your, on, on, um, in the Zoom so we know what to do. Jason, I'm just waiting for you to give me the go ahead so I can put on my show face. Yeah, I'm going to do the show. I'm going to do the show. Yeah, we're about to go live right now. Okay, you gonna count me down like five, four, three, two, one, or you just gonna surprise me? Yeah, I'm gonna. I mean, I think I can't do it from where I'm at. I'm gonna make you host. Yeah. And then you're gonna have to click on the right side. I'll walk you through it. Okay, you're gonna make me host, and I gotta click on the right side. Yeah, on the bottom right, you're gonna see live. Go live. Okay. I'm gonna do it right now. I see. You, you can now send a nonverbal feed. Should I see it now? Yeah. Am I, am I looking under the people or I'm looking under the um under the under dashboard screen, the bottom right. I see invite and mute all. Where do, where is live supposed to be at? Go to more. More. Oh, oh, I wasn't on that screen. Okay, live on Facebook, live on YouTube. Custom. Go to um live on custom live streaming service. That is correct. You once you click that, you'll be ready to go. Okay, it says you do not have permission to live stream. Hmm. All right, send, I don't know what's going on. Send it back to me. Um, how do I send it back to you, sir? You, you, you click on my name and make me host. 
Oh, well, Lord Jesus. Amira, I need you. <laughs> okay. Let me find you, Jason. Good people who are tuning in. I'm so sorry. We're having some slight technical difficulties. Look on his name, and you'll see three dots. Uh, prepare, click three dots. I can't even find Jason. Oh, Jason. Oh, you know why, Jason? Because I'm looking for your name and not the New York <laughs> Paulus <Republic> Cafe. <laughs> Boom. I, I got it. Hold on, uh, that's the reason why it wasn't working. Because... For your real name and not the New York Post Cafe name. Okay, what'd you say, James? You not um, you know how to do all this stuff? Because I'm supposed to just be, be pretty and entertaining. <laughs> you took care of it. I'm gonna go I'm gonna try to connect it to YouTube right now. Okay. I don't know what's going on. She says it's having a connection issue. I believe that you can do it. I have no idea what my dog is doing. He is really over here bugging out. <laughs> okay, if you are, I, I'm so sorry, people, but sometimes stuff happens. I'm so thankful that you all are still with us. We're going to get this show starting as soon as possible. We're just having some slight technical difficulties. And I was the one who was like, you got to let them in. I don't like CP time. So um, that's why you're seeing all this backstage drama. So just pretend like you don't know. Rob Hilton. I see you, Rob, but I can't hear you. Do you know how to unmute yourself? No, don't, don't make it sound like I don't know how to unmute myself. Listen, I've been waiting to get in. And it says Clark. I'm not Clark. I can't hear you now. Clark today, son. That you was Clark. Are you using somebody else's phone? I'm on my computer that I had for eight years. I've been waiting for this meeting. I I've been waiting for somebody to let me in. That's all. I was looking for Rob Hilton. I wasn't looking for Clark. And for some reason, yeah, I, that's not on my end. No, that's on your end. That's your phone telling the people the name. Even I know that, and I'm old. Come on, get your life right. No. Uh -huh. Let me try. I don't know what happened. I don't know. You can change know. the form, I believe. Hey, Barbara. Jason, what's the update? <laughs> Why is this? Now I feel like I need to be doing a dance. Why does my name say Clark? Can you put yourself on mute, sir? <laughs> Why you figure out? Yeah, can you change that to Rob Hilton? <laughs> no, I can't change it to Rob Hilton. Elena, you're live right now. So who is in charge? Jesus. Hey, good people. We are live. We are live. I'm so sorry hey. for the delay. We had some slight technical yeah. issues. Right um, Amira, do me a favor. Can you mute um, Clark? <laughs> yeah, we're really good. Uh, Oh, for real? Really okay, yeah, I'll, I'll treat it. Doug, what are you doing? Can we, let's mute everybody, mute everybody. We want to mute everybody. Uh, we are live, well, I'm not, well, I'm live from a living room. Uh, welcome to Poetry and Protest. Uh, my name is Dr. Halini D. Lewis, um, the former host of Verses at the New Eureka Poets Cafe, former New Eureka National Slam team member, and the host today for Poetry and Protest. Uh, actually, this show was inspired by the late, great Miguel Agarin. May he rest in peace. Uh, he used to teach a class at Rutgers University called Poetry and Protest. And when we did his memorial online, Line due to COVID-19 after his passing, I was like, Jason, yo, we have to do a show called Poetry and Protest in honor of Miguel Agarin. So I'm so thankful for all of you who tuned in today. Um, everybody that's on the Zoom part that I can see, hello, how you doing? And everybody that's on Facebook, on YouTube, and all that social media jazz, welcome to Poetry and Protest. I'm not going to take up too much time because we lost a little bit of time because of tech issue. How you doing? Um, so I'm going to stay right here and start off the show with a very, very good personal friend of mine. His name is James Ellaby. I've known James since 19... Oh, my God! Since 1998, maybe 99. <laughs> All of a sudden, I just felt a gray hair popped up after I said that out loud. <laughs> James Ellaby is a spoken word artist, 
a recording artist and author currently residing in South Jersey. He's been a performer for over 20 years and is consistently passionately about the power of words. Um, I asked for a brief bio and he took it to new extremes. Uh, let me tell you some things that you don't know about James. Um, James is a fantastic human being. He is the author of a chapbook from way back in the day under a different name, Inside <laughs> Joke Between the Two of Us. James is also, <laughs> James is also the, the author of, I want to say two self-published books now, right, James? No, one. <gasps> one, and you're working on your second one, correct? Yep. Correct. Okay, and today you just did a, a workshop online on how to become a self-published poet, correct? That's correct. Okay, fantastic. So if you're just not tuning in, wherever you are, welcome to Poetry and Protest. Uh, this, um, and I'm just going to read the, um, the description. Um, from civil rights to the Me Too, to Black Lives Matters, to indigenous rights, to women's rights. In relation to LGBTQIA+, poets have been using their voices to educate and battle injustices. These poetic activists share will share their poems and unpopular truths. Welcome to poetry and protest. And James, you ready to take it away, sir? Yes, indeed, indeed. All right. Uh, thank you for that intro. Um, this first piece I'm gonna do, um, it's about Amadou Diallo. Um, it, it, it just is very frustrating to know that the same things that we were dealing with then, we're still dealing with now. And it's just a testament to why we have to continue to fight and continue to struggle. And um, it's very prevalent and relevant to the climate that we are in now. So this is called Amadou. 41 shots rang out through my TV set. Channel 7, 11, 2, 4, and 5. Televised hate teleported into my mind. Murder committed, cops acquitted for their crimes. Times of outrage, front page states that third shot fatal, but 19 hit innocent target. Protect and serve? Who's gonna serve us protection from you? Just us? Trust the courts with justice, misinformed. Now family mourns for fallen hero, cops won us zero. Now who's next up to plate? Murder rate growing, prayers for God all knowing, but no solution to this pollution of police brutality as black communities form committees, more casualties in urban cities because it's hunting season and politicians give us reason to believe that they planted the seeds of racism and rookies out to get a cookie for heinous acts, attack our brothers, mothers losing sons, they got guns, run. Brother, run for cover. 41 shots was the beginning, and they will be others. More bloodshed and warfare. They don't care about our lives, so we must strive to stop the killing. How many of us are willing to take a stand to band together for our brother, Amadou? You are we. We are you. So there's strength in numbers, and you wonder why they fear us, but Lord, Lead us not into damnation for Amadou, Sandra Bland, George Floyd, Donna Taylor. There will be restoration. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, James. Woo! Yeah, I was remember. Um, when everything popped off of Amadou Diallo. And I remember going to bogeys and everybody was like, had a 41 shot home. Like we were just like, in my lifetime, that was the first time outside of Rodney King where I just felt like somebody just really got it bad. And that was just so terrible. Um, thank you for bringing up his name. I really appreciate that. And I think that, and this is just my subjective opinion that when somebody is murdered, in such a fashion like that. We owe it to them and their family to keep their names in history and to keep their names out in the universe so that we can learn from what happened and so that we can hold the people who did this accountable. 
And I don't think that that's always happening. And that's just what I say. All right, James, you got another piece for us? Or you have a comment about what I said? How you doing? <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, yeah, we do have to keep their names alive um, because the struggle continues. And it's the same struggle that we've been dealing with uh, since we've been brought to these shores. So um, this next piece I'm gonna do, um, it's kind of like uh, um, me getting some things off my chest. Um, me being a black writer um, of poetry, I sometimes feel like I'm being pigeonholed and, and being labeled and categorized where, you know, we all come from a creative people and, a, and a creative minds. So I wanna talk about that. And um, I'm a lover of science. I'm a lover of uh, sci-fi and um, things of that nature. And um, so this is, you know, this is my uh, getting things off my chest. This is called Blurred Blues. Getting an open online. Oh. <laughs> oh man. I um, thought you was like going into a zone or something. <laughs> I saw you bobbing and waving. I was like, oh, deep I could get deep in this place. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. I was just searching for the words, and here they come. One of my fondest memories in middle school was to make something explode or bubble over onto my desk. Who would thought that making a complete mess in my science class was beautiful? Who would thought that dropping small toys to demonstrate Newton's law of motion was my version of dropping science? A little black boy was able to experience life conundrum without questioning his curiosity. But now, as a black man, I'm not allowed to have a curiosity? Like I couldn't possibly balance being black and having a love for science in the same hand like a black man. It's not allowed to have an imagination. Like a black man can't ponder creation, planet, stars, black holes, and quasars. How dare I pick up a comic book and look behind the pages and illustrations of imagination. imagination. Like comic like books comic book. are for white people. Like the X-Men were not an analogy for the civil rights era. Like this society doesn't view us as mutants, an era, a problem, a mistake. Like COINTELPRO was not synonymous with the mutant agenda. You mean to tell me that kind of thinking was only reserved for white people? I guess a black man can't squander his time on science, philosophy, comic books, and sci-fi. Was it not black women that gave the astronauts the mathematics to go to the moon? Was it not Ava DuVernay, the first black woman to direct a $100 million film? Was it not Ryan Coogler, the director who, who produced the highest grossing solo superhero film ever? Didn't one of the greatest boxers to ever live named Joe Lewis coined the highly philosophical phrase, everybody has a plan until they get hit. But I'm a black poet who's resolved to writing one dimensionally, but who happens to have a stigma to see life in the fourth dimension. Seldom recognized or mentioned amongst his own or a true writer to hide my thoughts at home. When I know there's other blurbs out there like me, I know I'm not alone. My blackness is infinite. Just like my mind, it is infinite. It goes beyond black struggle and liberation. It understands that you can't have liberation without creativity and imagination. Just read Tiana Rivdu, just read Octavia Butner, just read W.E.B. Du Bois and Maya Angelou. I guess I can't be black and think the impossible. 
and resolve my pen to only speak about black struggle, to remain in a bubble while the greatest thinkers and creators of our time reshape our time. I guess I truly might be a blurb that has truly lost his mind. Blurred blues. Thank you. Thank you for listening. James Elby. All right, James. I hope that you're going to be sticking around for the panel discussion. Definitely. Yeah, because you know what? Let me tell y'all, like, it's kind of interesting when you're hosting and you know someone so well, and you're like, okay, I got to act like I don't know, but I really know, you know. So <laughs> if we get into some inside jokes and stuff, you know, just let us know so we can come out that box. But I'm going to try to keep it open because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. How you doing? If you're just now tuning in, this is your girl, Dr. Helene D. Lewis, reporting on behalf of the New York and Polis Cafe. This is Poetry and Protest, and we would like to take the time to thank our sponsors, the NEA, the New York State Council on the Arts, the NYC Department of Cultural Affairs, Amazon Literacy Partnership, and New York Community Trust for sponsoring our free online events. You can support us, and by us, I mean the New York Rican Public Cafe with a tax deductible donation at www.newyorkrican.org slash contribute, or hit us up with a cash app at New York Rican, well, the little money sign, how you doing? Um, Poets Cafe. Um, it is not easy trying to stay open and afloat in the time of COVID-19 and the New York Rican, like so many other theaters and performing art spaces is having a difficult time, but we are doing what we can to keep the show going online. And we do need your support, even though we have some sponsors. You can drop a dollar, drop $2, okay? We would appreciate anything that you can donate. Uh, James, listen. Unmute yourself because you didn't uh, plug your website. Oh, you didn't man. say how you can buy your book. You just was like, peace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm slipping. I'm slipping. Um, hey, let me get you some Jim <laughs> uh, You can always support me at James C as in cat, Ella B with one E at the end.com. Um, I'll definitely put it in the chat. Um, or you can reach me on Facebook. Uh, J.C.E. as an Edward the Poet on Facebook and J.C.E. the Poet on Instagram. And um, um, my products is all on my website um, and my spoken word musical album is on all digital platforms. Uh, but go to this website and, you know, purchase a download because, you know, independent artists need those independent dollars. So um, definitely support and trust me, I have some more words for you. Thank you. Love you all. And love you, Helena, always. Thank you for having me. And no problem. Don't disappear now. No, I'm, doing? I'm, <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm all in. Listen, we got um, Madison on here says powerful, cheer, clear, and wonderful. And uh, shout out to the Black Greek, um, the nerd reference. Yeah, James is our resident um, geek, but we love them. Geeks come in all shapes, colors, and sizes, and we have one. <laughs> Look, no, oh, oh, and I don't know if you're on here, but Jeff Carroll, shout out to you too, because you're also on the nerd squad. <laughs> all right, good people, this is your girl, Dr. Helene D. Lewis. I'm about to introduce our next performer. Uh, I've known this young man probably just as long as I know um, of James Ellaby. Uh, Rob Hilton, who for some strange reason is listed as Clark and got mad at me because <laughs> I didn't let him in, but we figured out what is going on. Um, Rob Hilton is the author of In America, Story of an Immigrant. Um, he was recently featured in New Jersey Magazine's October issue, a feature and contributor in the 2018, 2015, and 2014 Geraldine R. Dosh Poetry Festival. You know, that's some big dog stuff right there. Through 2017 and 18, curator for the Hoboken Historical Museum Poetry Publication, I Immigrant. He's a spotlight poet in the New York Times, the New Jersey Star Ledger, the New York, oh my God, I could just go on and on and on, but he's also a seven times national and regional slam team member. Rob Hilton is also 
a high school teacher. God bless him. I don't know how he's doing all that. And, and, and I'm sure he's going to talk about this in some of his poetry. He is from Kingston, Jamaica, and he immigrated to America in 1982. Rob, you are unmuted. We know that you are not Clark, and you are our Rob Hilton. Can I? Can you hear me? Yes, we can at Poetry and Protest. So oh, okay, can I? Can I clear up the Clark thing for you? I figured it out. But go ahead. My wife had a Zoom meeting with her family on Christmas. Uh huh. She used my computer. The name of her, the name of her family is called Clark. Uh huh. So how was I supposed to know that it wouldn't pick up Rob Hilton? And it picked up Clark. So I might, I, I almost didn't make the meme. And, and it wasn't my fault. For those of you who know Rob the way that I know Rob, you know this is so Rob Hilton of him. <laughs> Didn't I just say that wasn't my fault? Yes, I'm just saying, but we still love you. But okay, so let's just keep it on topic. If you really want me to come fight you, I can do that. Okay. I'll no, I can pro I'm, I'm protesting court. When um I got the the, the the green flag to go forward with um this show right here, I was like I have to have Rob Hilton in it. Um, when I went to your book release party, what was it last year before COVID nineteen? Um, I was just so enamored um by the, the body of work you accumulated in your book. Um, I've been a big fan. You forever and a day. I always tell people all the time, Rob Hilton is the one you want to perform at Bowdy way back in the day when I saw you do this song called Should I? Um, so people in the Zoom universe, people on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, um, sit back, strap yourself in. You do not want to leave um, the screen for the legendary, the iconic, the always want to fight somebody. Rob! <laughs> always want to fight somebody let me know if you can't hear me all right because you know we have technical issues sometimes um um protests right protest i protest a lot of things and uh in my poetry and goma how you doing brother and miss phelps i'm good man huh i just want to say hello to everyone yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's not all about poetry, man. It's about love. It's about respect. And Goma's been in the game for a minute, for a long while. I respect you, brother. All right, so um, I, I, I had a con convocation with my, with my school the other day, um, and I actually for Black History Month, and I wrote this poem. I'm going to read from my young blue sometimes. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> um, I've always been against it, but I'm in my house. Um, and as long as the word come across, I guess that's all that matters. All right. I have tons of poems that I can recite, but we got to move on. It's called Love Me Black. An open letter to America and the world. Kiss us black, not like do this. Kiss us like you know there is a heaven. The same heaven you use the same streets pages. Walk into our darkness and stumble over your wages of sin is death. And they have died over 400 years of death. Awake like Lazarus. Arise from your intentional slumber. Slide into our skin and discern our disregarded grievances. Let the ravages of our mother's wounds weave empathy in the hearts of their children. Open the book. Let the knowing begin and end. Triggers of hate, smoke of death, systems of bigotry, black fruits still hanging even now, still in the dead of winter. Ripen up of the pickings. Let them see the blood on the leaves and the blood in the tuber. Let the blood run 
soak the bindings of our book, run off the pages and stain your children's fingers. Let your children's hands be sore with atonement and recompense. For the continued ignorance of your children have been the source of our lineage unyielding pain. Let them finally remember honor and honor our outrage. Give them the power to break the repetitive staccato of ignorance. Tuck your children in at night with stories of our tragedies so that in the morning our children are given a fair chance to present masterpieces, the masterpieces that they truly are. Turn the pages, allow your children to swallow the sharpest words of our past and digest the most vicious sentences. Open the prose and allow them to reimagine the cons. Let the knowing extinguish the hate and pain to come. Bury the prejudices and the hypocrisy to come so that our children may finally walk in peace so that our children may finally talk in peace, dream in peace, become in peace. Love us black, not like Brutus to Caesar, not like the way people love the outside of things, but love us inside out. Hold us black. Hold us like you hold your crooked democracy. Love us earnestly. Don't love us conveniently like you love to look the other way in face of the monster that haunt our children. Stand up for our children while we still stand. March with us while we still march. Give us your last breath so we may breathe another day. Love our humanity like you are in love with the privilege you hide. Die for us even if, even if you must. Keep turning the pages. For our children will not sit idle one more day. Our children will not sit quietly one more day. Our children will not wait for your humanity one more day. They are not asking any longer. They are not hoping any longer. They are not wishing any longer. They will not give long speeches about telling it on the mountain any longer. They will not sit in protest and sing freedom songs any longer. For it is a new day. And it is time. It has been time. And time is up. Close the book on this. Thank you. things going on, I see. Rob. Rob, can you hear me? Um, not really. That poem was about... Rob, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. There's like some echo, some feedback going on with where you're at, you know, so... Just so oh, okay. No, nah, this, 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 this poem wasn't about... This poem was about black children and people who are being discriminated against uh, for so many years. Uh, it's, not, it's not about school. Well, is it safe to say that it was inspired after the meeting you had at work or something? Because you started off by saying you had some something going on. No, I had the poem uh, and it was uh, a convenient because we had a black history assembly. Okay. So uh, that's the first that that was the first time I shared it. So this is actually the second time I'm sharing this poem. Oh, now I see. Now I see. I mean, you know, it's it's always is the time to advocate for children. You know, that's just all right. I'm I'm actually Helena advocating for a change in America. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying that the children that are coming up now. I don't know if you heard the last part of the poem. They're not about praying anymore. All right. They're not about sit-ins. They're not about go tell it on the mountain. They are about making changes. Mm -hmm. And they have they have no they have no patience anymore for the injustices that are going on in society. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that captures the theme uh, to the poem. Well, I know you're going to stick around for the panel discussion, and are you ready to do your next piece? Um, yeah, well, I mean, whenever you are, I thought we were going to sit and discuss it a little bit, but it's cool. I can start the next piece. Okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we got to get
get it out for the panel discussion. Oh, okay, got you. <laughs> um, so the next piece is a protest for immigrants. And I wrote it, I wrote it with my grandmother in mind. Mm -hmm. um, this is also in the book that I previously published, my first book. You can actually uh, buy it on Amazon. If you go to um, Robert Hilton on uh, Amazon, and this is one of the poems that are included, that is included in the book, and it's called Poles. And what it does, it, it captures an immigrant, uh, an immigrant uh, mother who's actually in the process of working. And um, I won't say much more about it. I'll just start the poem. Mm -hmm. um, I do perform this poem a little different than other poems because I, I want everyone to listen to the words. And um, it's a common poem, even though it's an angry poem. When the mornings open up, this so-called shithole immigrant moved through the veins of the city to the same shithole job and paychecks she has been more than grateful for. Only to the dignity they have been trying to pry away from her with their jagged hacksaw words and sinister stereotypes. As if she ventured on their shithole of a banana boat to be ridiculed and dehumanized. As if she left her shithole of a country to be mocked and jeered like the pile of bile they have made her out to be. She clutches the same broom that their mothers and fathers had clutched before with their ballooned hopes and inflated dreams. Like them, she's not afraid to clean the feces that fall from the asses of those forgetful sons and daughters of the immigrants who came before. Like them, she is trying to scrub the hopelessness away from her lineage. So her back has become nimble, like a limbo dancer. From the scrubbing and the wiping and the heavy lifting she has been doing all her life. She hears the sounds of steel drums bursting through the thickness of the Caribbean nights and bouncing off the blues of her ocean. She hears the songs of her countrymen as she works, and so she stops and she dances. And she sings, this is the land of my birth. This is the land of my birth. This is Jamaica, my Jamaica. This is the land of my birth. She hears, she imagines her children running alongside the ease of the Caribbean trade winds. And so she squeezes out a smile behind a plethora of fears, her beloved country's oppression, and the shitloads of issues that led her to America. She remembers the promise she gave them before she embarked on, on the Iron Bird. She said, May I go find for work odd, and then they'll come back for Uno. Uno me pitney, I'm going to run with that for no. Her boys, two reasons why she is not ashamed of her hands smelling like shitholes. For there will be no raisins dying in light of her sons. There will be no dreams deferred, so there is no sleep for her. She was told that the dream could be found here, here in America, despite the glory and the vice of uncensored capitalism. Here in America, despite a history of racism and separatism here in america between the frigid freeze the cold glasses and the endless opportunities so she works she scrubs the shitholes in order to flush away the roadblocks and open up borders of opportunities the wind and rain have been formidable but she knows that her storms will stop one day eventually eventually just like the millions of storms that came through the ports of Ellis Island, Castle Garden, 
and the port of Philadelphia. Storms of fascism and communism and Hitler and Hirohito and Stalin and Lenin and Castro and Marcos and poverty and religion and genocide and apartheid and Holocaust and storms. Storms like hers. But she knows that one day there will come soft rains. Before the night opens up, this so-called shithole of an immigrant moved through the veins of the city carrying her stories. Stories that you have heard before. Stories just like yours. She will rest now only to begin again tomorrow. Thank you. Jersey, by way of Kingston, Jamaica, um, Rob will be here for the panel discussion. You better not go anywhere, Mr. Hilton. All right. I'm here. Okay, cool. All right, now the next person I'm calling. You know what? It's too hard for me not to say to the microphone. <laughs> doing that. <laughs> Listen, um, Rob. I got right here in the chat says, wow, 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 begin again. We stand on the shoulders of our ancestors. I child of an immigrant. Uh, somebody else just said, this is my new favorite piece for Rob Hilton. Joe, you still banging the mouth, son? Okay. All right. Larita, with your fabulous background. I'm not quite sure how I met Larita, but we are Facebook friends. And, and if you know me, um, if you follow me on Facebook, if you're into the shenanigans of Daddy Smokey and my job and the inmates and all that jazz, you know, from time to time, I put out an idea, but like, listen, I'm thinking about doing a show X, Y, and Z. Does anybody want to get on? And I always do that because I remember back in the day when I was a new performer and you would sometimes you'll go to season people who've been around and they would just be so like in your freaking face like, oh, I could not have time for that. And there's so much going on in the world right now that we have to stay united and unified. We don't have time for that. So every time I get a chance to work with somebody that I never worked before, I'm always in the putting them on the bill. So I want to say thank you, Larita, for telling me, yo, this is what I do and I can't wait to get down and let me read your bio that you sent to me. Well, I'm not gonna read it all. I'm gonna read some of it. How you doing? Okay, Larita Phelps. Did I say your last name right? Phelps. Phelps, oh, still working on it. Okay, <laughs> Phelps from several New York City boroughs being creatively born out of Staten Island and Brooklyn. You know what? I have been to almost every state. And when I perform at a college, I say, is anybody here from New York? I always hear somebody say Brooklyn. I was like, they're everywhere. Okay. <laughs> As a mother of three, that means she helped make three people who are now in the universe. Okay. Yes, As she has participated in various spoken word events, winning the spoken word and singing soloist categories and Staten Island's gospel festival several times. She was also recently published, how you doing? She's published now as a feature art author in a series called Breakthrough. The best-selling, is that with best-selling author, Johnny Wimbry, life coach and motivational speaker, Les Brown, woo, and astronaut, <laughs> Nick Haley. I am thinking I'm saying her name wrong, right? Nick, Nick Haley, yeah. Halley. Wow, yes. as soon as I saw an astronaut, I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the Zoom universe, those of you who are on YouTube and those of you who are watching us on Facebook, please give a Zoom welcoming to the one, the only, Larita. Woo! Thank you guys for having me. Um, the poem that I'm going to do first actually was written about six years ago, and it's, it's sad that it's still relevant today, and it's entitled Our Rights. You have the right. You have the right to die by a hell of those rights, hang by those rights, not breathe or walk home or start a new job by those rights. You have the right to have no rights. I had the right to stay in my CRV, scared to alert the authority that my destination was waiting for me, afraid that my daughter and her bestie would see the best of me on the outside of me, only to be told that my autopsy reports was my fault, that my flesh met their fists and their boots, that it was my fault that their tasers and bullets pierced my safety. 
I was born to die guilty of my own murder. There should be no fear of a rainbow, but you can't tell me not to fear the flashing red, white, and blue, not caring if the brown becomes red because the yellow fell before giving black and purple hues for not being and not wearing brass. They used to hold our hearts in our hands and, and give childhood goals of becoming like them. Now our babies only hold anything but dreams of making it home to give mama and daddy good nights and mornings instead of identifyings and homegoings. Courtesy, professionalism, respect, CPR. That's what's displayed on their mini tanks, but all we see is the CPR needed to revitalize those rights, to breathe, to live, to be innocent until proven guilty. When there's melanin, they're thug or tireless. But when there's a lack thereof, they're qualifying as mentally ill. He couldn't help it when he bombed that marathon or shot at that school, theater, church. He couldn't help it when he prayed with them. He couldn't help it that he shot up after he prayed with his victims. He was tired. He was tired. But you know what? So am I. I'm tired of, I'm sorry, I'm tired of the getting the news that there were mysterious identifyings, unexplained suicides or DWDG, death while decided guilty or DWIPASC, death while in protect and serve custody. I'm tired of the war flick starring citizens versus professionals set in war zones resembling a Bay Street, Rivers Avenue, a jail cell or back seat. I'm tired, I'm tired of the fear that is born in the pit of my belly when I see the possibility of a stop and frisk or a routine traffic stop. I try to tell my babies, you don't have to fear the protectors and service, but how can I tell them this if I still do? How can I tell them that their Black Lives Matter when yesterday's history tells them I'm a liar? How can I tell my man child that his large size will not be feared when yesterday's history tells him I am a liar? Mirandai's deaths or beatings filmed guilty but proven innocent, innocent obviously means our rights. <laughs> what rights? Thank you. Thank well, you. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you make your debut in the Zoom universe on the New Eureka um, virtual stage. Oh my goodness, the comments that are blowing up. They're like, go ahead, girl. Come on now. Do your words in my stomach, like, <laughs> yo, Larita, I know that we're going to be working together again soon, but I want to go back to something that you said, um, or at least what I got from it. First, when you said, I wrote this six years ago, yeah. and it's still relevant today. It's like, we're always fighting these same battles, like, um, uh, you can um, shine it up, uh, dust it off, uh, rename it, but it's still the same battles that we keep fighting over and over and over again. Like this, this notion of justice and who deserves justice and who is a citizen or a true citizen and who has rights to this land and all this other jazz. It's been from the inception of the 13 counties when them jokers came here and said, to the indigenous population, oh, you've been discovered. How are you going to discover somebody's <laughs> already been here? Okay. And, I, and I beg to somebody to tell me otherwise that almost every um, uprising or protest that we have now, or, or, and I'm not talking about the insurrection, them jokers is crazy. Okay, I'm talking about like pro life. Uh, for like um, marginalized populations or just justice can be chased traced back to this notion of who has the rights to this land and who is worthy. And I think that's the reason why we're still fighting these same battles over and over again, because the laws are written a certain way on purpose, you know? Right. But I don't want to get too deep because this is not really the panel discussion. I just felt like doctoring on y'all. How are you doing? All right, Marita, I know you got another piece for us because you can't just do one and be like, peace. <laughs> I do. Okay, I, I kind of I kind of figured she did because I asked everybody to do at least two. <laughs> okay. Uh, safety. What does it mean to be safe? What does it look like to be secure? If there's no melanin, it looks like a life that's happy and free to do any and every damn thing you well you you figure you could please to do, like storming the one of the most secure government buildings in the great nation. 
But if you are melanated, well, it looks like chokeholds, kneeling on necks, bullet holes into this deathly state, and fucking excuses of fearing for my safety. <laughs> yeah, I cuss because I'm just so tired of being told if they comply, blah, 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 blah. Riddle me this though, how does a taser get used to attempt to stop the not look like me's and the chase becomes their bruised pride while the same taser gets used to privately permanently stop the sleeping man who did not attack, did not drive while intoxicated and did not make it home because of that same differently treated, trained to kill if your ethnicity, if your ethnicity is not of the Caucasian persuasion. My son was imagined how I watched tears calling for me while the weight of the world disguised as a police officer sworn to protect and serve to show CPR, courtesy professionalism, I respect, but instead of having to give the CPR to attempt to revive that which was pressed through his neck, printing press, alerting the world that in a damn thing changed. If you are not on the blue line, Behind the, blow, behind the blue wall, chanting blue lives matter within the brass stall, you're against them on the black line with the black lives that also already matter. You are the thugs and terrorists. You are greeted with pepper sprayed roses and toxic gas lilies, but bullets that are rubber band manned and that is supposed to be all right, right? Who and why do the artists have to create a yellow based silent physical protest based on the yellow hearts of the very ones who are supposed to serve and protect, but instead steal what is not even theirs to take? Karens and Kens, Kens and Karens. These are those mofos who act like they are entitled to fake reports or not cover their salt and pepper seasoned faces or simply comply. My large college man child, my two outspoken young queens, me. We are not okay to exist, to shop to barbecue, to swim, to walk in the damn park, to jog through a neighborhood. We are not safe to sleep in our beds, sleep in our cars, be in distress, or be the ones to call for help. So how in the hell can you tell me that we are actually supposed to be able to live when the world is telling us that we don't even need to exist in the very world that we build, we buy, we influence, and we inspire? They want to be like us until they have the chance to be treated like us. They want to date us and sex us and inject to what to have what God give us, gave us, and some beg to seem seen like us, but until that all happens, they don't like it until those burdens and the murders and the oppressions and the oppressions and targeted and the, this is Sparta's become their silence. We have some allies, but they will never have the same plight of my kings and queens hailed from royalties because safe and secure will never, ever, ever be our true history and herstory. Thank you. Woo! Larita, we have a comment here from the iconic uh, Rob Hilton. He says, I don't know if you can read this. You, you see, Larita, you are the voice of generation. And I'm glad, glad young people like you are thinking like this. Your words matter. All right. You've been stamped with a good stamp of approval by Rob Hilton. All right, good people in the Zoom universe. I just once again want to take the time to thank our sponsors. No, the show is not over. I just know I have to thank our sponsors again because that's how we keep these free shows going. We like to thank the NEA, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, Amazon Literacy Partnership, and New York Community Trust for sponsoring our free online events. You can support us. And by us, I mean the New York Republic Paula's Cafe with a tax deductible don donation at www.newyorican.org or by a cash app, the money sign, New Yorican Paula's Cafe. I want to shout out all of our lovely performers that have performed thus far, and I want to keep the show going with a person that What's the best way? To, like, I have your, your bio in Goma, but I'm going to show you how far my love for you go and the work that you do and how you bring awareness to so many different issues and so many different things. Y'all not ready for this. Look. Can you see it in Goma? I still have paradigm shifting. And from time to time, I still play FBI and the CIA. There ain't no justice in the USA. Primo Mia. And I think that 
And Goma was the first performer that I ever heard that was talking about protests in the purest of forms on so many different levels. And I had never even heard of Mumia until I listened to Ngoma do this poem at Bogies. And then that made me go home and do some research. And that make me, made me look up some other things. So the power that we have in words as artists and creators to educate and to shine light on issues is, you know, it's just never under, underestimate the power of that. And with that, with that being said, um, let me read Ngoma's bio. Um, Ngoma is a performance poet, a multi-instrumentalist, singer and songwriter, um, artivist. I love how he said artivist, he didn't say activist. Artivist and paradigm shifter who for over 50 years, y'all hear me? That's 50 years. Some people don't even know what 50 look like, okay? He has used culture as a tool to raise socio, political, and spiritual consciousness through work that encourages critical thinking. A former member of Amiri Baraka's The Spirit House Movers and Players and the contemporary freedom song duo Serious Business, spelled B-I-C-N-E-S-S, -S, and Goma Wee's poetry and song that raises contradictions and searches for a solution to just and peaceful world, to a just and peaceful world. People, if you have never, ever experienced the art of Ngoma, all I got to do is say, bring your ears out and get ready. And Goma, you gotta unmute yourself. I just asked to unmute you. All right. Oh, and Goma, thank you so much for doing this for me. I'm just so happy and thankful and enamored with your presence every time I am around you. And I have, I don't wanna say all your CDs, but I have at least six different Ngoma CDs, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all okay. right. <laughs> So how y'all doing? So since, since it's Black History Month, I figure I'd start out with this piece. It's called Where I Come From. Oh, freedom. Oh, I come from back of the bus and colored water fountains. I come from segregated toilets and no niggas or dogs allowed. I come from segregated and unequal schools with hand-me-down books. I come from sit up in the balcony. I come from you can't buy a house in this neighborhood. I come from you can't eat at this lunch counter. I come from go around the back to get your food. I come from picket lines, bus boycotts, and fire hoses. I come from freedom rides, freedom songs, and jail cells. I come from we've been buked and we've been scorned. I come from we shall overcome. I come from black fist raised high, little Bobby Hutton, Fred Hampton, and George Jackson. I come from street fighting and rebellion. San Quentin and Attica, Black Panthers and free breakfast programs. I come from runaway slaves. I come from Amiri Baraka, Simba Wachunga, and Watu Wazuri. I come from poor libations on ancestors' graves. I come from the struggle to be free, to be free, to be free. one joint outstanding uh, as usual in goma <laughs> yeah i 
was going to do a different piece, but um, I think I'm going to do this piece. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This piece is called uh, The Real Black Panthers Ain't in Wakanda. Epigraph. There are over 69 political prisoners and POWs captured in these yet to be United States. This poem is liberated to them with my apology that there are too many to mention. The real Black Panthers ain't in Wakanda, never had vibranium. Ain't Afrofuturistic. In fact, their future is in peril. An endangered species, living heroes and sheroes, not Marvel characters imagined by Disney. No blockbuster movie by Hollyweird. America says they don't exist. But J. Edgar Whoever declared them dangerous. Counterintelligence programmed them, disappeared them behind prison walls. Warriors in the struggle for liberation never asked to be citizens, righteous soldiers. They did not wear uniforms. Guilty only of taking a stand to free the land, framed by a system that refuses to acknowledge their sovereignty. Go and tell the children, tell them we have real heroes that lived and died for freedom. Call them by their name, Fred Hampton, Little Bobby Hutton, Safiya Bukhari, Herman Ferguson, Bashir Hamid, Zaid Malik Shakur, Geronimo, as in T. Jagger Brett, just to name a few who died too soon, like Kuwasi Balagoon. There's no need to make shit up. Many still languish behind the walls, heroes and sheroes standing tall. Mumia Abu Jamal, Russell Maroon Schultz, Herman Wallace, Matulu Shakur, Jalil Mutakim, Robert Seth Hayes, Imam Jamil Alameen, Rochelle Sinke McGee, some locked down almost half a century. Yes, my friends, there are real Black Panthers. This is only a few that need to be freed. And they damn sure ain't in Wakanda. <laughs>
I don't even know what to say. I don't know what to say. Poetress was just jamming up in there. Poetress, you got something to say? Because you were just like, <laughs> yeah, I love Ngoma, man. I'm a big fan. I've seen Ngoma many places. Hello, Peace King. That was dope. Please. How y'all doing? Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and, I'm, and Goma, I don't know. Um, I can't remember. It, it might have been maybe a year or two ago. I can't remember, but you was I was in, in my house in my bed and I just saw like on Facebook, it was like Angoma is gonna be performing in New, New Jersey. I got up, <laughs> I put, took, took a shower, and I was like, I got to be there. And um when I was sitting in the audience watching you perform and everybody was just like staring at you, it was, it was young, middle-aged, older crowd, and everyone was just so in awe. I want to say like, um, I don't want to say like they were in a trance, you know, but they were just soaking up everything that you were saying and doing. And from what I can see from about the gallery view from the people who had their cameras on, they were doing the same here. And I just want to thank you for kicking the doors down for us to come through, especially with being a performer. I know in the early days of bogeys, like some people from New York didn't want to mess with us, but you was one of the first ones who came over and showed us mad love and was always willing to give us your advice. And I so thank you and appreciate for all that you have done for me personally and for all the poets was they came out of Jersey as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. You're you welcome. Know, it's it's kind of like my job is to, you know, to open the doors. Mm -hmm. Not just for the artists, but for people whose minds are shut too. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what I take on as my mission. Mm -hmm. well, you're, do, you're doing it. Typically to raise social, political, and spiritual consciousness. I don't write about silly stuff, <laughs> dumb shit. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and Goma, you're going to stay around for the panel discussion, correct? Yeah, I'll be around. And, and by panel discussion, y'all, I mean, it's going to be very brief, like 15 minutes. And then I'm going to see, like, you know, do we have any of our lovely people who's on the Zoom universe with us? If they want to get on the open mic list. Um, and um, wow, I'm just going to like keep it going. And uh, well, I, we won't be on here past nine o'clock. I'm going to tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Because I got to do my homework. I know I'm not in school, but I got to do homework for the university, for my students. Um, to all the teachers and all the educators out there, I know it's a difficult time. And our students need us now even more than ever. I just want to put that out there. Um, I don't know if you're ex experiencing what I'm experiencing on the college level, where the students are just like, I don't want to say I don't want to say clueless, but they sh clearly need a lot more support. And I think even after COVID-19, they're going to need even more support because they're losing, especially on the elementary level, um, like important social skills. You know, I'm a little bit worried about that. All right. Um, speaking of teachers, this next sister, Amira Shabazz, I don't know when was the first time I met her, but I'm going to say I've known her for at least the last three or four years. And um you know how you meet someone and you're like, yo, that's a cool person right there. Like, I got to keep them close. That's the feeling that I had when I first met Amira. And evident by early on, for those of you who was in the tech and we was having some issues, I was like, yo, I need you to co-host. And she was like, okay, I'm going to do it. I know she didn't want to. <laughs> I did, I did, I did. <laughs> because that's who she is. And for those of you who don't know her like I know her, um, let me read her bio. Amira Shabazz Blau, am I saying your last name correctly? Okay. Yes, is originally from Newark and now resides with her family in Central Jersey. She is a Newark public school teacher and a graduate from New York Institute of Technology, Bloomfield College, and the University of Phoenix in Phoenix, Arizona. As an educator, she facilitates technology-based education in STEM sciences, which is very important. Uh, and I wanna say also for 
um, young girls is very important as well. She is the published author and illustrator of the book, Breathing Through Concrete, an anthology of poems, a published illustrator and a photographer specializing in capturing life's moments digitally through art and the power of spoken word. And we know her as the person that's always behind that camera, but she is also known to rip down a microphone at will, anytime, any place, just because. Please welcome the one, the only, Amira Shabazz. Wow, thank you, Helena. Love you, love you. What an intro. Wow, I'm just gonna get into this piece. This piece was written this year for um, Black History Month. Actually it was written on Martin Luther King's birthday um, as a response to some of the feelings I had about us celebrating just one of our famous uh, people in history. So I'm just gonna get right into it. It's entitled, This Ain't No I Have a Dream Poem. This ain't no I have a dream poem. Dear Reverend King, happy birthday, Reverend King. Happy birthday. But this right here, this ain't no I have a dream poem. Dreams deferred are like tsunamis when unleashed, quaking and rushing, leaving no time to think. What, what? Not today, I stood, I stood with my hand crossed, folding and holding my heart, pledging my allegiance to a flag that never alleged anything to me. No, no, this right here, this ain't no I have a dream poem. Singing, we shall, oh, we shall overcome, never appeal to me. Get it? I was 10, hand over heart, words splat, lift every voice and sing, knowing all along I was born by the river in a little tent. And oh, just like the river, I've been running ever since. Cause mama, mama and them cried and sang the blues, watching views of Kennedy and Kennedy and Cook and Malcolm and Herbert Lee and Megger Evans and John Ch James Cheney and Viola Lusso and Fred Hampton and the unknown and the unknown Robert Spike and Warish jo Jackson until, until, until Emmett Till in open caskets, boxes like pine was our favorite wood, black memoirs of timelines in histories, non-spoken in his story or her story but it's our story. No, no, this right here, this right here ain't no I have a dream poem. Cause you see, I was four. I was four when King peacefully forged for freedom and jobs and jobs and freedom and life and life and little white kids and little black kids having futures of hands linked and bonds of human existences. But ain't it funny? Ain't it something when they were not talking about me, me and free and free and me, cause you know, I have a dream that one day, but this right here, this right here ain't no I have a dream poem. Cause you see, I was six. I was six when someone yelled, get your hand out my pocket and shots fired like rockets popping dreams and spirits and lives into futures of dead end places. So they thought, so they thought no justice, no peace. They left his family crying in the street. I am a man, banners flew free, tattered and shredded into dreams over decades, over decades of more. We shall overcome, but when? This right here, this right here ain't no I have a dream poem, cause I was nine. I was nine when the fingers pointed to the skies, or maybe it was the North Star. Sweet Lorraine was a motel, shots fired, dreams painted on faces, pointed to fingertips and someone yelled, I won't get to the mountaintop with you. I won't, before dropping and all took knees and tears and pain and rains of more. I have a dream, but it's gonna be deferred. Yeah, don't you know, I was two. I was two when we went on that freedom ride. I was five when my rights became legal. Bloody Sunday was my six year old birthday memory. Old to Selma, burn Mississippi, burn. That was my freedom song. I was eight, I was eight when a man became the greatest. Ali, Ali, Ali. I was nine when you told me I was allowed to live free. Lee, any house, anywhere. 
just not over there. I was nine when the Chicago Seven walked the line. I was 11 when the first black mayor of my city went to work. 13, run, Shirley, run. Pass the baton to Jesse when you're done. I was 25 and 29, and it's been a long time, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Cause see, I was 49 when it was time for a black man to lead the country. Tell me, have we overcome? And you know the rest, I guess I'm just ready, ready, ready for a change. And a change is gonna come, oh yes it will. Cause this right here, this right here ain't no I have a dream poem. Brooks, Floyd, Taylor, Sterling, Gray, Garner, Rice, Amadou, just to name a few, they all had dreams too. Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black, li Black, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter to me. Now watch your feet, watch out for those yellow letters in the street, cause this right here ain't no I have a dream poem. Wake up, wake up, dreams live where you sleep. Dreams live where you sleep. And it's been a long time coming, but now, now I think I'm ready. I'm able to carry on and change gonna come. So yeah, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Reverend King, in the key, in the key of Stevie Wonder. Happy birthday. Woo! As they say, when we'll be at the New York Rican Poets Cafe, shots fired. Amira, fantastic, powerful. Um, Rob Hilton wrote a paragraph. Let me see if I can get him to unmute himself so he can tell you right now. Rob, unmute yourself. Rob Hilton, he's not unmuting. I don't know if he's not There you go. Rob, it was on, you typed so much. Can you just tell her personally? <laughs> no, I, 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 I listen to her words and I think it's a very strong piece. I also, um, I had a line that said, no more go tell it on the mountain. So I related to her work because uh, she had a line from MLK that says, no more, no more uh, of sitting, I forgot what she said, but, but we're ready to move on in a different way as far as protest is concerned. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, like it's really serious now. Yeah, um, that poem came from all of that and just, just let me of me being the age that I am and 57 yeah. years ago being in the same spot in the same songs with the same tune. Same. What the heck? So mm -hmm. that's where that poem was birthed from. Um, so, Helena, you want me to do a second one or? Oh, yeah, what is that? Yeah. be disrespectful if you did Okay, so the second one is, um, I, most of my poems are about um, children. The second poem is what I think and what I feel each and every time. My sons, I have two, 25 and 23. When they leave the house as young men do, this is how I feel. Should you live or should you die? No tears from these eyes shall cry cause I know legacies. I bent that towering bending trees resistant, resistant to my spreading legs, birthing you in tough black melanin, in tough black mud, so your melanin clung, smeared and captured spaces left bright, untouched by sun. You, my son, I breathed into your soul strength and breath and life and legacies of short existences while the ancestors, the ancestors held you down, holding you, holding you so you would not drown in this life. They call them kings, yet they strangle them with rings and streets grab your ankles as you track through the jungles just to make it home. The hunters draw their bows, striking limbs and piercing hearts through shouts of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, but you, you matter to me. That color passed on legacies of blackness, my favorite color it used to be. I fold my black dress neatly, stroked with soft cushioned hands on callous palms, holding or folding them up in prayer, matching garments, matching garments with veils, waiting to cover whales. 
your color, your color be white so the angels can find you and carry you through the night. And my eyes, my eyes don't close. They have no right as long as you are out there. Black mothers, your sons through tats and war scars are ours. Don't martyr your love, send them forth and above. They deserve life. Legacies torn, legacies torn, legacies. You cannot have my king. I refuse songs of sorrow to sing, son. If you make it not through the valley, fear not. I will stand tearless at the rally, spear in hand, trigger on spot, no fear in my heart. I planned this for some time. This land will give back what I claim to be mine. You, you, my son, are a child of God, deserving love, life, and victory. So no, should you live past me or should you die before, I am prepared, spear in hand to give you life. Hmm. Wow, listen, and I just wanna say this, right? Um, your, your book, okay? I've been using your book <laughs> at my agency for my poetry class wow. and having the clients, you know, like um, uh, um, their thoughts, like I'm encouraging them to write and process their feelings. I think writing is so, therapeutic but when you have someone uh, who is a person of color and most of the people that I work with are incarcerated that's just how the facts are um and for them to know that you wrote the book you know you published the book that you did the, the illustration like it's been inspiring my ladies to to want to write their own book of poetry mm -hmm. when they leave um prison so I just wanted to share that with you thank um, you I make sure you get a couple of copies to share with your uh, your clients there oh no you're gonna cause them. a fight yeah, I can see them now Dr. Louie Please. <laughs> Thank you guys for appreciating. Um, I want to, um, Douglas, I know you're not feeling well. Um, I don't even know. I don't even see your name anymore, but we had another performer, Douglas. Um, um, he texted me. I just want to send out some healing energy towards him. Um, fantastic dude, fantastic. Um, he's a photographer as well. And a, a video, he, he did the videos for um, my shenanigans and my reels. And um, if you see me on the stage lately and there's some pictures of me, like I'm like this and that. Doug is the one who took those photos and um, he wasn't feeling well, but I saw that he tuned in. So I just wanted to give him a shout out, let him know that I, that, that I wish you just feel better, Doug, because I love you too. Um, before we um, go into the panel discussion, uh, I would like to share a piece. Uh, today, I was part of the 41st um, Marion Thompson um, Lecture Series for Rutgers University, and I was commissioned to write a piece. So I would like to share, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, All Eyes on America. How do we get here? It's been 45 days, 45 days since 1-6 this date, I would never forget. Like 9-11, I would never forget. I would never forget. I'm scarred permanently. I watched, but I did not want to believe. Believe the boiling over of white fragility, the culmination of power unchecked in all its, ele in its entitlement. I was wearing blue jeans, a gray hoodie, black sneakers. I bust out of my office and said, the Capitol is under attack. I did the same on 9-11, except I was wearing a different outfit. And instead of Capitol, I said, New York. I could not, I could not, I could not like this. Stop watching, stop watching and horror the attack on democracy, on hope, on change, on justice, on facts, on science, except this time, by homegrown terrorists claiming a rigged election. When the reality of the matter is, despite your electoral college, despite your voter suppression, despite your attempt to stack all votes in your favor, you still lost. Ironic, isn't it? And as the news replayed images of Black Lives Matters protesters, memories encoded in my DNA relived the trauma the trauma of the final seconds of every lynch man woman and child that became billy holiday's strange fruit my body is still keeping the score and i wonder if those patriotic nationalists using confederate and american flags to beat capitol officers were equally enraged by george floyd brianna taylor sandra bland khalif broader and trayvon martin who would have turned 26 years today if he was not stalked hunted and murdered 
I will forever say their names. I will forever say their names. All eyes on America, how do we get here? I still can't find the words. They are lost somewhere just above my head without the elegance of James Baldwin, existing in spaces of insurrection and racial polarization that did not start with the one who became 45. It's bigger than him. All eyes on America, all eyes on America. How do we get here? This normalization of hate, this fine line between right for some and wrong for most, this caste system of racial hierarchy, the have nots versus the have more than necessary, and policies for benefit of an assumed superiority, this fragile democracy and all of its glory. That is not always for the people, by the people, with its allegiance to have truths and omissions and selected amnesia. All eyes on America, how do we get here? This push and pull between progressive social movement and backlash of right wing agendas. This remembering of history in the eyes of the victor turned victim whose 13th state citizenship has morphed into a reality show called Make America Great Again. I'm sorry, I cannot say amen to that to Jim Crow, to water hoses and German shepherds, to slave states, to slave codes, to poll taxes, to church bombings and little girls dying, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, to being three-fifths of a person, to forced labor, to 1985 and the move bombing, to more bones at the bottom of the Atlantic. I can't say amen to that. All eyes on America, all eyes on America, how do we get here? is the answer in the unmarked forgotten graves of slaves and indentured servants. Is it the reason Flint still does not have clean water, the victims of the Triangle Shirk Waste Factory or the Radium Girls of Orange, New Jersey? Is it in Barry Goldwater's Southern strategy, the political alignment of conservatives, the unsolved murder of Marsha P. Johnson and every trans and cisgender woman? I wish, I wish, I wish I could pay it no mind, but I need to know is it in the unedited version of D.W. Griffith's A Birth of a Nation? Is it manifest destiny, provisional whiteness, co-signed with the blood of indigenous people who did not get the memo that they had been discovered because they were not male and white and immigrants in the land of their ancestors as colonialism took what was theirs and replaced it with settlers, genocide, broken treaties, starvation, sickness, false assimilation, and trails filled with tears. All eyes on America, all eyes on America, how do we get here? This notion that some of us deserve a bigger slice of this pie than others. All eyes on America, all eyes on America, how do we get here? My forefathers and foremothers could not pass, so there was no initiation into whiteness. From generation to generation, we stayed black. From the soles of our feet to the palms of our hands that give shapes to fists on posters, knowing as one, we cannot afford not to be burdened with the revisiting of history and all of its shameful moments. For we are living in the now that was created in those moments. All eyes on America, all eyes on America. Well, I don't know how much I heard because I looked up and it said I was muted. <laughs> Thank you for hanging with, out with us. We're going to do a brief, and by brief, I mean a 15-minute panel discussion. And then if you are interested in getting on the open mic, um, just put a hand up or tag me in here, and let's see what we can do. We're not going to be able to get a, a thousand people on, but I'm sure we can get one, two, or three people. All right. Oh, but I want to say this. Before we start um, moving forward after the panel's discussion with the open mic, I need to see a video of your face before I unmute you. Because I don't want no more naked people uh, um, dancing across my screen like last time. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. All right, good people. I'm going to ask to unmute um, Baba and Goma. I'm unmuting Amira Shabazz. I'm unmuting Loretta Phelps. 
I'm unmuting James Ellaby. I'm unmuting <laughs> Rob Hilton, <laughs> aka Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my life right. Let me get my life right. All right. Thank you, good people. Um, this is our panel discussion of poetry and protest. And I'm going to start off with a general question. It's open to anyone who would like to um, say that about this. And the first question is, when did you know your words had power? Oh. Um. Well, I discovered that actually doing um, acts of doing pieces in church, believe it or not, my pastor and first lady are some of my biggest supporters and um, doing the gospel fest and gaining my courage and actually coming to your open mic the one time years ago and I was very shy and I did a piece that I had just written called Mistakes and it, it was, you guys were very receptive. So me doing certain pieces and being told that Dang, that's how I felt. Dang, you told my story. Thank you for saying that. And I, I started um, calling myself an intercessory poet because I was telling other people's stories when they felt like they were the only ones. And I let them know, you're not the only ones. You'll get past this. You'll survive this. And you'll be able to be uh, to encourage the next person. Okay. I'm getting feedback. I'm somebody. I don't know who that is. Okay, I, I have a hunch, but I don't want to say it out loud because we have to start fighting. Okay, uh, anyone else? When did you realize the words had power? Okay, uh, all right, moving up next along. What would Goma you wanted to say something? And Goma wanted to say something. And Goma, go ahead, and Goma. I realized it. When people started following me down the street going FBI, CIA. <laughs> now, I realized it really very early on because I was fortunate enough to work with, with Amiri Baraka and uh, with, in, with, as a member of the Spirit House Movers and Players. And in order to be a part of it, you had had to audition and when I auditioned and I made the cut I realized oh I must have said something <laughs> that made sense that, that might have moved people so then I kind of started from there uh, trying to do this mm -hmm. and basically that's when I figured it out you know, okay. oh <laughs> um, I would like to um, pose this question when you are writing a piece, do you sit down and make a conscious effort to make it a political statement or a statement on social justice, or are you just trying to get something off your chest? I, I can answer that one. Go ahead, James. Um, a lot of times it's either moved by an event or some outside stimuli. And it's like the words just are burning inside me and I gotta get it out. So that's usually where, um, you know, poems of protest uh, are created for me, you know, for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Anyone else? J James is being like, um, um, usually James will be like, give you a 30 minute answer. I'm James, I'm like, you are really conditioning your stuff. I'm proud of you. He's like, <laughs> does anyone else want to take that? Um. Sure, if, if I may. Um, I have two grown children now. One's 23. I have a 23-year-old daughter, 19, soon to be 19-year-old son and a 12-year-old daughter. So it's like when things happen in the world and like when Tamir Rice was murdered, my son was the same age. So that hit, that hit for me like that could have been my baby. When they did the shootings at, and when the shootings happened and I think it was Connecticut and those six-year-olds you know, murdered in their classroom. My daughter was six years old. So anything that usually transpires, um, it just, it pours out. I'll be sitting there. I may wake up from a dream and nine times out of 10, I do most of my writing overnight. So that it just pours out. Whatever comes out, it just pours out onto paper or on my phone or wherever I am at that time. Okay. Uh, there is something out of, uh, I am very well known for being a comedic performer. Like, you know, um, 
finger my cooch, uh, flip your nipples off. You know, if you know me back in the day, you know, and I write these plays that have like these um, undercurrents with um, social work themes in them. And, and I'm setting up the question to say, um, do you find that people try to pigeonhole you or put you in the box? Or are you just a funny comed- uh, poet? And then when you do something like controversial or co- political, they're like, oh, we didn't know you had that in you. Or if you are a political um, power to the people type person, if you do something a little lighthearted, are people looking at you like, yo, what you doing? Yep. Uh, you're going to have to give more than a one yet. Yeah, um, Yep, it's not going to suffice. Well, I didn't, I didn't hear no discussion. I'm definitely <laughs> pigeonholed. I'm definitely pigeonholed. Am I not muted? I'm definitely um, kid power. Motions run high when dealing with young people and their hearts are broken and my heart is broken and the poetry spills out from there. And then the other side of me is I'm, I'm just sick and tired of sick and tired. And so that activism comes out and I don't have any love poems. So that's what I'm going to say. That wow. That's me. I, I don't have a love poem. My poetry is all emotional based on lives that have touched me and um, molded me and changed me in some kind of way and the fight for human um, justice and for people like us just to be looked at as we are human. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh- even my even my love poems are political. I've been pigeonholed, but it's okay because that's the reason that I do what I do. Yep. And and primarily, if you write, the question is is why do you write, and who is it that you're trying to reach, and are you actually trying to give people information? I try to give people information. So not only do, do I vent my anger or my displeasure with what's going on in the world. I try to give you some something that you can chew on, you know. Rather, even in the even in my love poems have some, you know, political some up in it. That's just the way. That's why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. Okay, All right, good people. Now everybody here did two pieces, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and when you're setting up your lineup or you decide you're going to perform, how do you decide which poem that you want to do first? Oh, how did you decide which poems you wanted to do today? Oh, I'll, I, I'll go first on that one. I didn't mm-hmm. know. And I was, I, I, I remember at an, in Rawway when Mike asked me to come and do something and I was going to be going against Roddy and I almost died. And I called James. I was like, James, wh- what could I do? Like, I, she's going to kill me. Um, so he said, Amira, do this poem first, do that poem next. You want to do a poem that uh, gets the attention of the people, um, so a fiery piece, and then you can do your more mellow piece and then end with end with a bang. And so I've been following that rule since I spoke to James when I was a nervous wreck, and it's been okay. So that's my answer for that particular question. And I got that from Rob and Big Mike. So you got that from Rob and Big Mike. I think a lot of times when people are um let's say you're doing a feature and I'm gonna talk about you know when you get books and you're like they're flying you out and they're transferring you stuff. And most shows when you are flying out you're looking at doing like 45 minutes to an hour. And um for me um especially if I'm on a university campus, the first thing I do when I get to the campus is I want to see if they still have a hard copy school newspaper. I want to see their most recent school newspaper, or I want to go online and see if I can download their school newspaper. And usually when I get there, I place the order of my poems based on what is relevant inside of their school newspaper. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, this is, this is some triple OG gangster stuff I'm dropping on y'all, all right? But you should also have like an idea in your head of what you want to do as well. And I find that when I'm writing, especially when you go on college campuses, sometimes they'll tell you, listen, um, stay away from this topic, stay away from that topic. So I ask before I even get on stage to, or whoever is bringing me down there, what subjects are off limits? You know, and, and and some people be like, well, I don't want to do that because, you know, it's my art and I got to let it all out. But if you censor, if, if you take that that stance, okay, 
you're never going to get some stuff out sometimes. And maybe you can't do your hardest hardcore piece. Every place is not for a sex poem and things of that nature. But what I find is that when you respect the venue and respect the school, nine times out of 10, the students are seeking you out to hear other poems and get other information from you as well. You know, so I'm um, just something I picked up over these years. But when sometimes and, and I'm, I see somebody has a question uh, in the chat. Sometimes an issue is so heavy on your heart, you have no chance but to write about, it. especially when you see people being killed and murdered and fighting. Like, I'm like, what is all this fighting about? Okay, people is like, oh, it's black, it's white. Whiteness is, is, is provisional whiteness. Because if you know anything about history, you know that back in the day, and I'm talking about colonial times, um, the people who had power were the white male land old owners and indentured servants and the, the African slaves and the Native Americans were banding together to say, yo, what y'all doing is not right. And then they have to say, well, listen, we're going to make something called provisional whiteness. I'm sure they didn't have a meeting about this, but then it was like, because you share a skin tone that looks like us, that is us against you all. But when it really is, it's poor versus those people with money, power, and influence, you know, so I don't always like to get caught up in um, black and white and things of that nature, because I really think at the core essence of it all, it's about who has the power and control and who's willing it. Sadly, I can't hide my skin, uh, but if I'm Irish or if I'm from um, Scottish or someplace like that, and I am of a lighter hue, I can hide in my provisional whiteness, you know? All right, let me see this person who got their um, question here that I don't see. It was a long question. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm having problems seeing your name here, but I'm, if you put your hand up, if you wanna ask the question yourself, I'll call on you. Let me see if anybody putting their hands up. Going once, going twice. Okay, no hands up. Okay, and the, the person said, you see a hand up? Oh! Yeah, there she is. <laughs> oh, there you go, young lady. Okay, let me unmute you. Ask to unmute. Okay. Now, how do you say okay. your name? Uh, Tegan. Tegan? Okay. Hi, Tegan. Welcome to Hi. the first. <laughs> um, so, I'm someone like you guys. Like, I just write constantly. I just need to get my thoughts out on paper, on computer, whatever. Um, but as, obviously, I'm white, I like to write about like social change and like movements like that, but how do you think I can do that without like speaking over or uh, like stepping on the toes of people of color and just speak like people who have actually experienced the things that I want to write about? Okay, did y'all hear the question? Everybody heard? Yeah. Okay, who wants to go first? Are y'all processing that? Rob's okay. Yeah. Okay, because I was like, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let me dive in. Okay. Um, as they would say, hello, I lie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, first things first, right? I think that whenever you are coming from a pure heart, people would know that, you know. So I don't think it's about stepping on toes as much as it is about letting people know that these are your views and that you share them with people of color as well. And I'm going to say, because you are white and you brought it up in your you know, question, is that your biggest problem might be, especially in these times, is how do you tell other people who look like you, hey, we might need to re-examine how things are done and we might need to take a look at these issues as well so that we can make the world better for everyone. Does that make sense to you? Okay. And what I find is whatever it is that you want to write about, you write about yeah. because somebody needs to hear it. Okay. And if you are saying, listen, I'm a, um, a defund the police and we want to have more money domestic problems. We want to um, um, take a look at the prison industrial complex. Listen, I'm, I'm protesting. Okay. I don't like what happened with the Black Lives Matter protesters versus the people who were part of the insurrection. You say whatever your truth is and let the chips fall where they may. Where they may. Okay. Clark wants to oh, add. now y'all want to talk. Okay, okay. Go ahead, Clark James. wants to go. Yeah. You want to go, Amira? Go ahead. You want to go? Yeah, I'll go after I'm you, Clark. Oh, well, let, ah. let me unmute you Mr. Hilton. Mr. <laughs> Rob. 
Yeah, you on me, so I couldn't I couldn't speak. I don't have feedback from here, do I? You have a slight feedback, but it's better than before, Rob. Okay. Um back what's the name of the young lady that spoke earlier? This would be Tegan. Yeah, Tegan, what do you what are your topics? What do you want to write about? We don't we don't need empty topics from Caucasians. We really don't. Right now, in America, right now, we need some strong truth, all right? So I don't know if you can tell us some of your topics that you want to write about, that you're thinking about, because we're not playing around anymore, and we need some help. We need some help from whites, blacks, Indians. Everyone needs to put their hands up and just, like, give a helping hand, all right? So I would like to know some of the topics that she writes about. But you know, Rob, I, I kind of like. I mean, she, excuse me. I'm, I'm going to disagree with that because I feel like she was asking a question, and now you're you're putting her on the spot to say maybe her topics are not worthy enough for you. No, nah, definitely not saying that. You're saying that. Because and you know, and I don't want um T to feel like if it's not worthy of what we think she should be writing about that she shouldn't write about it. Because All right. The, uh, Helena, let her speak, though. What is she? Okay. Well, okay. But I'm just like, you see again? If you don't want to do it, you ain't got to do it. So let me ask you. I'm yes, I'm sheltering her. Don't shelter her. Let her speak. <laughs> I see what I did there, right? Go ahead, Tegan. Tegan? Um, so mostly because I've kind of like grown up in the climate of so I'll, I guess I'll preface it by saying that a lot of my family is from a little bit further south. Um, I go to school in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and so their outlook on like police involvement, that kind of stuff is very, a lot more conservative than my own. And so I try and write about like different perspectives from them, like police brutality and um, just like trying to from like a point of view as if, if I were to give them this piece of writing, like I want to help them understand like this isn't normal, like this is not okay that this is happening on such a wide level. Um, and so that's one of the biggest things I, I feel like I need to write about. And then a lot of it is maybe a little bit more niche, like, um, like people of color being, I guess it's like new age segregation, like being pushed into um, low income neighborhoods and like I don't know a more correct word but like ghettos just like being forced um to live in a certain area and then also the like the negative relationship that people of color have with um like medicine like doctors stuff like that and so those are, those are the things I like to do a lot of research on um and just things I feel compelled to write about mm -hmm. uh, can I, uh... yes James one, one of the greatest, one of the greatest um, is love. And if you're coming from a place of love, then you also will encounter the truth. And so let, let your love be the base and be the fuel um, that you need in order to get your point across and, and, and come to the truth and speak that without um, hesitation, uh, without fear, um, because that's what's going to reach the people that need to listen, you know, that needs to hear what you have to say. And that, you know, that's not just with, you know, with, uh, you know, the black community or that, that any people, you know, whenever you wanted to reach anyone, if it comes from a place of love and to, you know, from that place of love comes the truth and just do it without any, any hesitation, do it out without any fear. That's, that's what I, I agree with James and um, thank you, Tegan, for sharing that. And that's what my first poem was about. When I say teach your children that this is a teach your children about the past because we need more children like Tegan. Tegan looks like she's no more than 25. So in my eyes, she is a child. 
And we need we need we need people like Tegan, all right, to go out and spread um, the topics that she mentioned, all right, are topics that I love, all right, and I hope she's passionate about it because we need some people on the front lines here to change America and bring America forward, all right. And those topics are on top of the list, and I just wanted to hear it from her mouth. I think it's it's good to hear it. From the person who, you know, it, it's good to hear it. And I thank her for that. And I thank Tegan as well. And we are out of time. And I want to make sure I get Mahal Kikita on. Uh, but I want to say this to everybody that might be listening in the Zoom first. Um, poetry and protest isn't always about black and white issues. Okay, there's people who are disabled who need to be protesting. There's people who are, are um, indigenous who need to be protesting. There's so many different ways that we can be protesting to make the world a better place for everyone. And I just wanna encourage anyone out there that if you have, as James says, love in your heart and you want to protest about something, the most simplest thing the act of protesting that you can do is register to vote and make your vote count. You, 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 that insurrection was really about the fact that, well, part of it was this man did not win the election. Okay, make your vote count, run for office, and do something to spread something other than hate in the universe. And um, now I know I'm not saying your name correctly, so you're gonna have to tell me how to say it, Mahalkita. Um, so please forgive me if I'm for mispronouncing your name. Um, I'm asking to unmute you. Hi, how do you say your name? You said it right, Mahalkita. Oh my goodness, I feel like I should get a gold star. Oh, yeah. I gave it to myself. Okay, oh. you have a poem for us. Yeah, I do. Um, just want to say something real quick. I live in Seattle and I grew up, I'm also of Puerto Rican descent. So mm -hmm. um, this is a trip for me because I've always wanted to be a, like on a New York uh, cafe, okay. but it's never happened because I live so far away. And when I try to get in on their Mondays, like they're, they fill up in three seconds. So mm -hmm. this is the first time I get to read. So it's like, okay. wow. Well, Thank I'm you. going to give you um, but this is not your first time reading on a um, on a Zoom or on an open mic, is no, it? No, but, okay. but but it's the first time um, a New York um, New Yorker cafe, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to say on behalf of the legendary New Yorker Poets Cafe, welcome to the Zoom universe that is the New Yorker Poets Cafe. Everybody, clap it up for the one, the only, Mahal. Thank you. And Mahal Kita means. The, the name is my father's father's from the Philippines. Um, Mahal Kita in, in, in Tagalog means I love you. So that's what the name means. So more stuff. All right, here we go. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. My daddy ain't Jay Z. My daddy ain't Drake. You claim to be free, but I know that you're fake. You can't be liberated and use the N-word. N-word this and N-word that. You ain't got the common sense of a cat. You can't be liberated and use the N-word. How many Jews call themselves shade lamps? How many Jews call themselves concentration camp stamps? You can't be liberated and use the N-word. Internalizing hatred makes no kind of sense. You may as well join T. Rump and Mike Pence. You can't be liberated and use the N-word. You claim to be so down, so progressive, pro-Black. You lost your vision when our neighborhoods were flooded with crack. You can't be liberated and use the N-word. My guys are Biko, Nasser, Mankiller, and Hamer. My poems don't need no stupid disclaimer because I knew we built the pyramids, we built the mounds, we gave the world its most beautiful sounds. We sailed the seas when they were in caves. We resisted all the time they tried to make us slaves. We can't be liberated and use the N-word. You can't be liberated and use the N-words. 
How many Filipinos do you hear calling themselves gooks? It's time for you to, it's time for you to talk to the elders and research books. Why would you call yourself the last word our people heard when they were hanging from trees? Don't try to hide your ignorance. Fool, please, you can't be liberated and use the N word. I don't care if you're a lawyer. I don't care if you make art. When you imbibe in their oppression, you give them your own heart. So many degrees and I still don't know who you are. Hey, why don't you peep this? The line that called the black star. You can't be liberated and use the N word. Words convey history, power, energy. Ain't no mystery when you see the synergy between what comes out of your mouth and how one thinks. And when you catch up with a stench, it really stinks. Cause your shitty view of the world permeates the air. And when you gaze upon my, upon me, you'll see a death stare. Cause when push comes to shove, you ain't on my side. Your psyche emits the essence that you cannot hide. Cause you can't love yourself and use words of self hate. Cause what it means is you really hate, you really emulate the people you claim to be so different from. Yo ho ho, but no bottle of rum. Cause my mind is clear and I won't imbibe from that spirit. Never drank the Kool-Aid, smoked poison. No, never got near it. So don't waste my time with excuses for saying that word out loud. Just close your eyes, shout it to the skies and make the KKK proud. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. You can't be liberated and use the N word. That's it. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you, Mahal. Thank you, thank you, thank you for Sadly, you uh, we have run out of time. So uh, we're closing the show. Maha, what a great way to show it out. I want to say thank you to the one, the only, the legendary Ngoma. And Goma, make sure you tell your wife I said hi. I haven't spoken to her in a while. Okay. Um, Amira Shabazz. Hey! <laughs> Amira Shabazz. Lavrida Phelps. The one and only, my good friend, James Ellaby. The one, the only... Jersey original, uh, uh, Rob Hilton. I still go, Rob Hilton. And I want to send some love out to Douglas C. Kala. I know he wasn't feeling well and he signed in, but he was supposed to perform. And I know he would have ripped it down as well because that's how Doug does. And poetry for dancing to, and, and clapping and thumbs up the whole time I saw you. Everybody couldn't see you like I did, but I saw you. I want y'all to be safe out there. I want y'all to be kind to one another. I want y'all to remember that we are in it together and there's more people who think like us than, than the people who stormed the Capitol. And with that being said and done, if I could find my favorite song by the one, the only Patti LaBelle, it was, I used to play it at, uh, well, maybe not. Oh, here we goes. Um, this was the song I used to close out verses every time that I did it. It's called What Can I Do For You by LaBelle. And I think that we need to be looking at each other from this perspective. What can we do for each other? How can we lift each other up? How can we make the world a better place? Y'all be safe. Tegan, love you. You can always hit, hit, hit me up with an email. Um, info at hglpoet.com. I see you, Madison. I see everybody. I want y'all to take care. Thank you, New York and Paulus Cafe, for letting me do this show. And y'all be safe out there. Teresa, I see you. Madison, I see you. Puppy Singer, I see you. Helen, I see you. Miss Sheehan, I see you. Nikki, I see you. Valerie, Helen, Nicole, Barbara, Nikki over there, D. Hudson, Matt, Rob Simmons, or is it Rob Simmons? I don't know. Valerie Hernandez, I see you. James Brown, I see you. Ja, I see you. Stacy, I see you. Ryan Lewis, I see you. Um, Raymond, I see you. Me, I see you. Y'all be safe. Remember, we need more love and less hate. This is your girl, Dr. Helena D. Lewis. 
be quite alive, but my living room with my dog Smokey. Smokey is not impressed at all. <laughs> Jason, thank you. I'll see you next week for Black Tastic. I got a fantastic lineup for that. You don't want to miss that show. How you doing?